Hi, welcome to the Forward Food Tech podcast, where we explore the future of food and agriculture with the people who are taking us there. In this episode, your host Rob Ward is speaking to Ian Wheel, CEO of Breeder. Breeder is a livestock supply chain technology looking to digitize existing livestock supply chains. The big picture is that farmers are being asked to collect data for the supply chain and do reporting for various organizations. But there isn't a lot out there to actually help these farmers become more productive, sustainable and grow their businesses using that same data. In the heart of what Breeder are doing is to help farmers market their cattle through better data and build supply chains that they can enhance through genetics, animal welfare and more. Without further ado, here's the conversation between Rob and Ian. Ian, welcome to uh, our first video interview for a ag tech business um, as part of the leadership hub that we are to, we've been running now for a number of months. And I'm really interested today to hear about um, uh, your business and some key insights you've had. First of all, tell us your full name and your company and what do you do? Yeah, firstly, Rob, thanks for having me. And it's been great to be part of the leadership hub over the last few months. So uh, Ian Wheel, I'm the founder of Breeder. Uh, Breeder is a livestock supply chain technology um, looking to digitize the existing livestock supply chain. So I grew up in Australia on a farm there, um, met a girl, moved over here, and uh, I've been here now for 11 years and, and really focused on helping British agriculture become more productive. So There's, there's a lot going around the world on ag tech, um, and it's interesting that you're here. I mean, I guess partly because you married an English girl, but um, in, from an ag tech perspective, um, Developing a business here, what what has been helpful here regards infrastructure or, or um, grants or, or investors? What are the things that really make this place a good place to be for an ag tech uh, early stage business? Yeah, well, it's interesting because when we were a founding breeder, we actually did consider moving to Australia or I'd, we'd been living in America for a while as well. So we did look at the options for setting it up. But one of the things that we really liked about the UK is that the consumer is actually quite close to the farmer. So the supply chains themselves are reasonably compressed. They're quite close. And there's also a great level of infrastructure. And I think we saw an opportunity in what farmers see as regulatory to actually see as something that could be productivity benefits and existing data capture to be able to really help farmers be more productive. So, you know, it was something we definitely went through, but, you know, that was one side of it, like the, the supply chain. I think the other side is, you know, the investment potential here, um, people are looking to potentials around ag tech now. Um, and between sort of Europe and America is where the core of a lot of that investment is happening. And I think those hubs that are building up around ag tech are, you know, incredibly valuable when you're starting. Like some of our best farmers and uh, early stage people came through working with early stage accelerators or agri tech groups to be able to sort of learn, make the mistakes, you know, go through the trough of despair before we came out the other side um, from learning those things. So, you know, very, very important. And we've found UK and you know, a certain percentage definitely of British farmers to be really innovative, entrepreneurial and sort of wanting to engage in what the future of agriculture is. So t tell us a bit more about Breeder and the inspiration for the idea as a founder and what really is, it, what makes it different and why it's likely to be the, uh, the, the, the big thing in um, animal farming. Yeah, well, you know, I think all ideas come from some level of frustration. So, you know, I think having grown up on a farm, but then done a fair bit in supply chain, you know, I saw a lot of red tape that farmers were being asked to do. And, you know, that was collecting data for the supply chain. That was, you know, reporting on stuff for DEFRA or communities that are out there. But there wasn't a lot of that then being used to actually help those farmers become more productive and, you know, helping using that data. So it was always the question of, well, farmers, people are trying to sell my data, but the reality is that data is incredibly valuable for the farmer. It helps him prove out that he's delivering a good product. It helps him gain productivity and it helps him go to his customers and say, look, I'm consistently delivering a product that you want. And therefore, you know, let's build a longer term partnership. And I think, it was, you know, the original frustration was around EID. A lot of people had EIDs in the ears of cattle, but they were not getting the full value out of that. And it wasn't being used to really track productivity in the supply chain when that was a huge opportunity. So 
I think, you know, what that makes us different is you know, certainly at the heart of what we're trying to do is not just be a software platform that we charge farmers. We're trying to help farmers become more productive. We're trying to help farmers market their cattle through better data. We're trying to help farmers build supply chains that they can run and enhance and get more productive on the back of that through improving genetics or welfare or whatever it is. So I think, you know, the heart of what we're trying to do is that. Um, So we're not a farm management system, although we have that. We really are a supply chain tool built for farmers. Um, And then we win when they win. So we have a financing arm that based on the farmer's data, uh, we can offer them financing to be more productive and to grow their businesses. And so therefore, you know, we make money out of that, but we make money through helping a farmer grow his business. And I think that's what makes Breeder different is that sort of the ability to really drive farmers' businesses, not just be a cost on their bottom line for software. The, the, on your, um, when one of the conversations we've had, you identified um, the amount of waste or inefficiencies that amounted to a massive saving in area usage. Um, what, what, yeah. Just talk that one through because that was mind blowing. That, yeah, so, that, yeah. so I think what we're seeing, and you know, this is a problem for the whole supply chain, is that at the moment the animals are, you know, there's a huge variance of when animals are, are slaughtered, and uh, there's also a huge variance of the specification that they're delivered in, and that variance is not good for the consumer. Um, that variance often means that people are growing animals for longer than they should because they've had poor welfare. Um, actually, the highest growth animals and the best performing and most profitable animals and the least environmental impact comes from animals with really high welfare who have had a really happy life and have grown really well through their whole lives. And, you know, I think what we've led to at the moment when we start to look at the data that comes out of breeder is there's a number of animals either through bad genetic choices or bad feedback that they've got from up and down the supply chain because they don't know, like they're breeding for, say, easy calving, but that doesn't make it a productive animal in the meat supply chain. And what we're seeing is that, you know, we on breeder, our farmers are selling their animals five months earlier than what would be otherwise sold that, and still getting exactly the same yield. So you can effectively take that five months and replace that with other animals who are growing really well and really happily. And, you know, the productivity gain and the ability to turn over and everything else is huge. And, you know, it leads to around it. You know, if everyone in the UK was doing what people in breeder are doing, then you can reduce your land use significantly, or you can reduce your feed input significantly and still produce more beef. Um, uh, it's, it, it seems to be a common thread within the ag tech innovations that we're seeing in lots of different places. And we cover off all over the world, different ideas that we get to meet is that in an industry that doesn't feel like there's waste and waste is an emotive word, but there is actually, once we start to get really clever about the digital technologies that sit around that, we can identify waste at the benefit of the farm and putting profit onto the farm Selling a product to the farming industry, what are the key points of resistance that you've had and how, you, how have you overcome that? Yeah, so it's, I mean, there, there's always scepticism, especially with new technology, I'd have to say, like, especially when you're doing something as differently as what we're doing. But I think um, the key points of resistance we've had is, uh, you know, it is around the data. So, you know, we're helping a farmer collect their data and our terms and conditions say that that data is the farmer's data until they share it. Or if they sell the animal, they sell the animal with a service history. So the same as you would sell a car, you sell the car with the previous service history. We would sell an animal with what medications it's had and what weights it's had, and but not confidential information or prices, but like, like that thing. So I think the core thing we've had of challenges around the data, and I think, trying to show farmers how that data is valuable to them and how it can help them prove out their profitability and that it is their data at the end of the day. Like they are the owner of that data, but by just hoarding it and not doing anything with it is not helping them grow their business and it's not helping them become more profitable. Um, So I think that's been one of the things we've come over, um, come up against. I think how we've broken down those walls. Well, we've had, you know, farmers sell to farmers and uh, farmers recommend farmers. So we've had a really good core group of farmers that have helped 
build video case studies, build case studies to the broader farming network. And so that's been huge. The other one is by proving at the bottom line. So, you know, we've helped those farmers achieve better prices for their animals. We've helped them deliver animals in specification. And at the end of the day, they're making more money. And, you know, that's how you break down those barriers is sort of deliver on what you say you're going to deliver on on that side. I think that's fantastic. I love your 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 straight talking. Uh, that's it's infectious. I hope for the rest of the industry. Ian, it's good to hear. So, when it comes to uh, working with um, that data and how that integrates with other forms of data around the total farm, have you got any thoughts on that? In because the parallel we often talk about at uh, Forward Food Tech is is about the fintech industry and how data integration with other businesses that collect data has been their success. And I'm just interested to know how you are thinking around data beyond the ownership of it and the aggregation of it is is more of a subject around integration of other people's data with other data. Have you got any, anything on that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, we've been very specific. Like it either helps the farmer directly, um, so the data interactions we do, or it will help the date the farmer communicate better to his customer. So those are the two sides of data that we believe we need. So if you speak to a supermarket, all supermarkets nowadays want to know the antibiotic usage across their supply chain because it's a, it's a big measure of welfare. And so if we can aggregate data from medicine hubs into breeder or breeder into other medicine hubs that helps that farmer prove it out, it's the farmer's health records, but it helps him then articulate to his customer, being the retail contract that he's got, what his welfare standards are. So I think we do make sure that those are our two big ones. We are not in a company where we then want to aggregate. Where in FinTech, you've seen a number of people taking that data and then repackaging and selling it out the back, you know, and, and that becomes a profit line that's sort of a little unknown to the to the user. Um, we, we do see farming as something that's built much more on trust and handshakes. And, you know, the expectation is that, you go by your word. And I think that's where agriculture does differ in some of that stuff. So you just, we're very conscious of that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so good to hear about the supermarket connection. Obviously, um, uh, I'm, we're very passionate about that because our lives have been from production to consumption and back again and as a business. And um, really like to hear how you managed to get a major supermarket uh, involved or interested in what you're doing. Getting retailers involved has been, you know, actually a, probably a lot simpler than you would have thought. And and that is because the challenge on the farm uh, around growth rates and consistent product delivery and delivering something the consumer wants is what is all those inefficiencies are currently driving. And if you take the farm level and you roll that up to the retailer, you know, you go from 200 animals to 50,000 animals, it's even more pronounced in terms of the inconsistency of supply. And so from a retail level, they want to deliver a product that a consumer comes back and buys every week because meat is a high value product and steak especially is a high value product um, and drives other purchases. So, you know, from our perspective, these supply chains are changing. Um, People are wanting to have visibility of what's in that supply chain and they're wanting to have predictability about what's in that supply chain as well because that enables people to plan. It enables us to deliver a better product to consumers. And at the end of the day, it helps the processor um, deliver a premium produce into that supermarket. Um, But it also helps the whole industry grow and deliver a better product for consumers. And I think that's where... I would, and that's one of the reasons we decided to work within the UK initially, because we really do see there is good alignment between processors and retailers and the farmer trying to move in that direction. Yeah, it's one of the highest concentrated retail uh, markets in the world, the UK, and and, and, a, and a very advanced one. Um, we're certainly the biggest online um, consumer market uh, as a percentage of population. So, so that that gives that that integration is key, isn't it? Um, I'm just uh, so here's a moonshot now. Where, what um, we've got a number of key events happening in the world economy. Um, we've got a new president in the US, and um, and we've got trade deals that are going to be discussed with uh, all around the world for the UK. Where do, where do you see the impact on different types of meats that's being reared around the world and 
and how the distinctions happen between that and, and where, where does Breeder fit in that story? And this is from an international perspective. So it's interesting. Like I'll take it back to our family farm. We have uh, swine, pigs, um, cattle and sheep on our farm in Australia. And it's uh, with what we're seeing is that, you know, Breeder itself has started its focus on the beef industry because it's a big industry. It's one with some of the biggest challenges around the environment and everything else. Um, that have been portrayed in the media, at least. I mean, not that the other ones don't. I think what we are seeing is a huge amount of demand for animal protein coming out of Asia. Um, and that demand is having huge impacts on global supply chains. So you've seen growth in uh, exports from Argentina and Brazil skyrocket uh, in the last few years, which, because cheap, Protein is still very high on the agenda of the global market. Um, You've seen semi-decline in places like Europe where the production is sort of capped out. But even COVID has now swung that back the other way. We've actually seen 16% growth in the last quarter on lamb in the UK consumption. Um, We've seen like beef consumption going up at 8%. So if you take sort of the global market dynamics with Asia, which is driving protein demand, you actually now take the COVID, I'm cooking at home more, there's been a big switch towards uh, meat consumption again, yet, you know, the population's growing. We need to be able to address that need to the consumer. We need to be able to do it more efficiently um, because, you know, even if you take alternative proteins that are coming through and, you know, you, you look at... Uh, all of the you know fake meats or whatever you want to call them that are coming through, you look at the demand over the next 40 years. If they don't exist, there's not enough land. So we need those sort of meats to also exist in parallel from a protein market perspective to be able to deliver, one, the efficiency in the core animal protein market, as well as be able to deliver the global demand for protein that's coming through. So, you know, I think I'm not a big advocate of, you know, one versus the other all have their place and we're still seeing growth and the growth dynamics are changing and export for the UK is going to become more relevant in a post Brexit world as well, which is another big dynamic that's happening Mm -hmm. um, at the moment. So, you know, I think we all need to aim to deliver the best possible product we can as efficiently with the highest welfare standards with the least environmental impact. And I think those goals exist no matter where you are in the world and um but one thing's for sure consumer demand isn't dropping and it's going to keep going so how do we engage with the industry to be able to deliver that in the best possible way and will this identify different types of production for um livestock of the same type of meat let's say beef and different um carbon footprints that sit around that and any sort of branding that that would to support that product if uh, if it's you know one from one area of the world to another is this something you you are going to be part of yeah we're already doing stuff in the uk which is you know grass-fed supply chains versus specific breed supply chains like wagyu um and each of those have their own dynamic that they have to go with it. And, you know, that is part of what the consumer experience wants. They want to know where that came from, how it was delivered. You know, we were approached the other day about doing uh, antibiotic-free detection. So you can detect each animal that's had antibiotics through the supply chain and actually deliver an antibiotic, even in amongst where you have to treat animals with antibiotics because it's bad welfare not to but high antibiotic uses is a different thing so how do you actually build like antibiotic free supply chains that come out of it so you know i think the opportunity to be able to tailor to different users when you've got the data that tracks that and therefore get price premiums where appropriate is exciting with what technology can deliver i think it's an interesting space because at the end of the day you know covid has also created a lot of very poor people in the world um, and actually, often some of the most developed, the poorest people are are in the developed countries. So we've got to have affordable food. At the same time, if someone's prepared to pay more for something because they want a welfare level that, that they believe in, then that distinction is important. I guess the consumer um, challenge here is that is how honest is that? And yeah. where the industry has gone wrong is that lack of integrity um, and um, misleading labelling, at least, if not in some cases, fraudulent. So it's it's been it, what what the what the market the consumer market desperately wants is that integrity right the way through that is 
that is not um, just veneer and just marketing um, wash. It's simply it's the honest situation. Yeah. And, you know, that's where being able to, you know, work being farmers at the heart of everything we do is very important because at the end of the day, if that farmer feels attached to what they're delivering, well, they put more onus and emphasis on doing a really good job for that consumer. That's where Breeder has a strong point and that's like where we want to work with processors and retailers is to be at the heart of helping the farmer be more successful because the more successful they are, the more they feel they're delivering a great product into those customers and then onto the consumer, um, the better the data matters, but the integrity of the actual producer matters even more would be what I'd say. That's brilliant. So what's your targets as a business? I don't mean revealing anything confidential, but something, what are your your business targets in the next six months? What's, where do you, uh, I know we could talk about a moonshot like in the next five years, but actually realistically, what the next six months, what are the key things you're focusing on, including raising if you are still today and, and who are you looking to work with if you are? Yeah, so for us, really, it's, you know, it's continuing to grow. We're in a, quite a strong position now in the UK market and continuing to grow that market is, you know, really at the heart of everything we're doing and, you know, expanding things like our financial products to be able to make sure that we can help farmers grow and get more value out of breeder and, you know, do all of that. So that is the heart of everything we're doing in the next while. Um, we will, we have started on cattle. So, you know, for us opening up multi-species and, and being able to handle pork and uh, lamb as well that goes along um, will be important. So we've already, that works pretty much there, but that's been an important part. And I think, you know, if you go towards the end of that six months, um, we will be looking at, you know, further funding to look at international expansion because the the livestock industry is global um, and there is, there is opportunities globally to be able to address uh, a more digital supply chain. And they are very, it is still a very manual supply chain the world over with lots of data silos, lots of <laughs> lack of feedback and, uh, and, I'd say there is enough out there for us to be able to help a lot of farmers be more efficient, um, but at the same time deliver better environmental impact and you know higher welfare product. That's fantastic. Um, the last six months, nearly, and you've been part of the uh, Forward Food Tech Leadership Hub. Um, how did that work for you? And what would you say to somebody else thinking about joining that? Yeah, so I think what's been really exciting is it's been you really tailored it very well to startups at a similar sort of stage, and so a lot of the challenges that we're having Um, because every business has challenges like in in terms of growing and what we need to do. Um, There's a great, really good group of people. And, you know, as well as learning from you, Rob, it's obviously been just as good to learn from all of the other founders that are on that group Mm. and, and how we can address the challenges we need to do. Because, you know, whether you're delivering strawberries into a retailer or you're delivering meat into a retailer and how you help communicate the benefits through them to the consumer, you know, there's a lot of learnings that we have as an industry as supply chains change and compress and all of that sort of thing that I think the leadership hub has been brilliant for. And, you know, I think there's a great, great group of people that we also have on that and, you know, looking forward to the alumni as it starts to grow because that <laughs> in itself is probably going to be the most valuable bit for it for everyone that joins. So, Thank you. And well, it has been, it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you. You've, you talk straight, you deliver on efficiency while deal, dealing with sustainability. Uh, you know, it's an exciting space that you've, you are working in. And Breeder has got so much potential. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, working with you. And uh, thank you yeah, so thank much. You. Good luck to your team. And I uh, look forward to uh, uh, staying in touch and, uh, and being with you for the long term. Take care. Thank Looking you. forward to it. So thanks, Rob, and really appreciate it. So. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Thanks very much for listening and we hope you stay healthy in the midst of this global pandemic. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, give us a five-star review and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. For more information and takeaways from this episode, please visit forwardfood.tech. See you next time.